Jay here, Coffee Conversations with Greg J. Oh, let me fix my hair. Antennas sticking up all over the place, taking in the good vibrations of the universe today. Wow, what a great time uh, this is for us at Coffee Conversations with Greg J. We are broadcasting live from the Dream Creator Arts Annex, where we have a, a fantastic uh, art exhibit up. Uh, this is called Long Beach Rising, Murals of the Movement. 255 East 4th Street, just letting you know, change of scenery, right? Uh, the second thing I'd like to share with you today in Long Beach, California, where we originate, this is uh, Long Beach Gives Day. Long Beach Gives, you know, Long Beach is a city that has a ton of nonprofits all over uh, the city and uh, they are serving various sectors of community, providing programs and services. And I'm just really proud to be a part of two nonprofits. Number one, uh, board president of the uh, Arts Council for Long Beach. And number two, intimately connected with Dream Creator Studio, building community through media. And just uh, really honored to take my body of work, right? And uh, began to make moves, not only just in Long Beach, but across the globe is what's been happening for me at this stage in my career. And I just gotta tell you that uh, as part of that long career, I have been so blessed, so privileged, so honored to roll uh, alongside our guest today, my co-host, and she's actually, look, she's, a hip hop music, well, just in general, music industry icon. There's no question about it. She probably has more platinum in her hallways than the Grammy Museum, even. You know, it's probably, you know, you know how they say uh, uh, artists, they describe an artist, they say they've sold 75 million records. I bet you uh, our guest here, our co host, has sold a billion records, you know, we were able to uh, cumulatively count. And I'm just so honored today that she's joining us. Uh, let's bring her on in. Wait, Violet, Violet Brown, ladies and gentlemen, she also uh, is on the board of directors of the Arts Council for Long Beach and uh, today's Long Beach Gives. So we're about to talk about that for a minute before we bring our guest in. How are you doing this morning? I'm good. I'm having a, some of my coffee, some of your good old coffee there. Nice. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I drank all of mine and I can't go get any more because I'm uh, sitting right here. <laughs> I'm excited yeah, about today. Exciting about today is, is really, really great. You know, Violet, let's explain to the people, first of all, what uh, uh, Long Beach Gives is all about. And then let's just share uh the organizations that we represent and how people can give. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. Long Beach, well, you have, I think, all of the details, being the president <laughs> of our uh, of our organization, the Arts Council of Long Beach. So I mean, maybe you have the particulars, but I do know that there are over 200 nonprofits. I believe it's 265 nonprofits mm -hmm, mm -hmm. across the great city of Long Beach who's participating in this today. We do this once a year. We do this to raise money for all of our nonprofits. Um, many, many uh, have exciting things going on today. Uh, just like we do at the Arts Council of Long Beach. We have a lot of things that we're doing. If you're in Long Beach and you know about Lola's, Lola's on 4th Street, you gotta go check that out today because if you go in there and you eat with them and you mentioned the Long Beach Arts Council or the Arts Council, we will get some of that money today too for our nonprofit. It's an important day for us. And you can get some great food while you're at it and get some of that, they call it green crack sauce in there. That's the most delicious thing you will ever eat in a, in a Mexican restaurant for sure. Um, anyway, so go check that out. And uh, Greg, like I said, is the president of the Arts Council of Long Beach, and he may have some of the more broad details about the nonprofit. I know mostly about us. I know about the Arts Council of Long Beach. That's who I'm representing today. And 
I want to thank my my people who have already been donors for me all week long because we had some early giving that started on September the 14th. And a lot of you wonderful people have already donated. But today it's down to the wire. So we're asking I'm asking you again to hit my page, hit my link. It'll be in the comments here, too, on uh, this show and uh, give. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give. You know, it's interesting, Violet. I, I too, am representing the Arts Council for Long Beach. But as I began to meditate on this whole thing, I am part of so many nonprofits that I just want to amplify <laughs> everybody. You know, we got the Arts Council for Long Beach, Dream Creator Studio, uh, uh, West Angeles Community Development Corporation, Living Legends Foundation. Uh, 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 Black Hollywood Resource Center. I mean, come on now, you know, maybe this is not only a pill to support, right, the Arts Council for Long Beach, because it is deserving of your support, Dream Creator, deserving of your support, but all of those ones that are all around the region, man, if you can gain an opportunity, go ahead and, and uh, you know, bless us as we do this work out here for the community. This is real work out here, and, you know, it costs, right, to do things to support the community and be about the people. We are all about the people. You know, I want to say you. this. Yeah, well, go ahead. I was going to say thank you for your work on the Living Legends Foundation. Um, I'm honored to be, I was awarded a Living Legends Foundation uh, plaque a few years back. And it means it's one of the most meaningful things that's happened in my career. So mm -hmm. thank you. For yeah, you know, I don't do much, you know, when we say quote unquote work for them, but I just wanted to amplify them because, uh, you know, Pat Shields and everybody over there do an excellent job uh, with that foundation. I think it's a noble cause. I, I really love their gala every year. It's like a big reunion. Uh, and then, you know, the whole thing about living legends, I talk about this with my brother all the time about how, man, we were in it in the golden years, you know, and uh, yeah, living legends, when you see them, you see, uh, just think of how uh, our collective experiences in this thing uh, called black music uh, have resulted in just so many Hallmark, you know, Hallmark events. And speaking of living legends, you know, we wanted to gather today to put our collective uh, experience of the arts, uh, you know, the music, the music industry. And I'm just sharing with you, you're right here in Long Beach. And I, I always toot your horn, Violet, because I mean, folks don't know <laughs> down here in this city, you know, what they have right here residing in Long Beach, serving the community in Long Beach, in you. And, um, you know, you've we've invited some friends along today to talk about this whole thing of hip hop. It's the 50th year of hip hop, 50th anniversary. You've heard it, y'all, all over the news. There's big concerts. There's all kinds of stuff out there talking about the 50 years of hip hop. And as I contemplate hip hop music, you know, I watched that thing come into uh, into existence as a young executive. You know, I'm not a hip hopper, but I was I would have front row seat, floor seats <laughs> to the to the game as it as it blew up. And uh, we uh, you're a living legend uh, in terms of the growth of that, the making of hip hop. And uh, I'm going to let you introduce our living legend guest this morning. And let's talk about hip hop music. All right. So I'm thrilled to have this gentleman on with us this morning because I have worked with him for so many years. And uh, I was a buyer for warehouse music and I bought all of the hip hop for all of our stores across the US. And um, there was a guy in LA and I was fortunate to be based in Los Angeles area. And I was fortunate to have a radio station in L.A. as uh, K-Day Radio, 1580 K-Day. And I think that you guys, if you've been around for a while, you know about K-Day. It was an FM station, an FM station, an, an AM station. I'm so sorry. An AM station that became so big that everybody was listening to AM radio back then because everyone wanted to hear K-Day. K-Day mm -hmm. was the first radio station to come out and, and 
put a seal seal of approval on hip hop. And there was one guy there that really spearheaded the whole thing. And his name is Greg Mack, the Mack attack, mm, Greg Mack. Mack attack. And I am so fortunate to have him in the studio today. Greg, good morning. What an introduction. How do I live up to that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, wow. that is awesome. Welcome. Good morning, Greg Mack. You know, here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Greg Johnson and I, we used to work together at Stevie Station, KJLH. So I got to know Greg, been a fan of his ever since. So anytime Greg or, or Violet say, you know, we want you to get on, I'm getting on. Somebody get, somebody got canceled this morning. <laughs> but uh, thank you for all you're doing for the community now, Greg. I, I watch you. I'm watching you. I see you all the time. <laughs> Yes, and, uh, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's just fantastic what you're doing. And Violet, I, Violet Brown, I can't, you know, I can't praise her enough mm -hmm. because uh, this lady has done so much for not just hip hop, but for me personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's a whole bunch of stories that I would love to share, but it'll take up the whole hour. So I'll just shut up. But ah. I'm just happy, <laughs> happy to be with you guys this morning. Look, we got time. We're going to be on, uh, we're doing a streamathon, you know, today. So, hey, let's go relax and, and share with us. You know, Greg, man, is it 50 years for us on the West Coast? Well, no, it's about 40. Uh -huh. uh, and, and the reason I say that is because when I started the rap format, which uh, for those that don't know, uh, I started the very first ever rap format in the world, not just west coast but they weren't even doing it on the east coast and that was in uh august of 1983 late last week of july it, i remember it specifically but um you know that that is where it's got its radio start and when i was doing it there were so many headwinds there were so many people that were mad at me politicians parents record labels uh, but it was something that we enjoyed and so we played you know, a lot of radio stations say we're playing what you what you want to hear. We actually did, you know, and so I was just so happy to be a part of that. And so people like, uh, you know, Violet, uh, another young lady uh, from uh, Tommy Boy Records, Monica Lynch. These two ladies were so instrumental in what I was trying to build there. There would be no mix masters without these these ladies. Wow. I'm sorry, I can rattle on. You got to tell me, shut no, up. Sometimes. No, that's good. No, it's all good. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. I, you say you mentioned the mix masters. I saw some video of an event that was held recently in, uh, in Long Beach with the mix masters, and the, the video, you know, the cuts in there was kind of a sizzle reel, if you will. So the cuts in there I couldn't see too, so closely. I know you that you were there. I did hear that. Did you have all of the mix masters at this event in Long Beach? You know, uh, um, I think we were missing one or two, but yeah, most of us were there. You know, there's probably about 10 of us or 10 mix masters that, uh, you know, to this day, I, I would still say they're the best DJs that ever, you know, uh, existed, especially my guy, Tony G. But we, we were, you know, a lot of people <clears throat> are like, y'all did this, y'all did that. We didn't know we did all that. We were just having fun. <laughs> that's fun, that's right? all it was. <laughs> We were having fun, even though I was working like, you know, 18 hours a day, we were having fun. And so uh, it was so special to be over in Long Beach. Uh, and, and and it's weird because the mayor of the or the ex mayor of Cerritos gave us an award yeah. in, uh, in Long Beach. And uh, so, you know, I'm just happy. I, I've never gotten a lot of awards. And so sometimes I think about it and the other times I'm like, whatever, because um you know, I ruffled a lot of feathers by starting rap. And I assume that's what it is. And and uh, it's all good. But I still have good friends like Violet and, and you, Greg. Right, right. So because of the art form, you know, I mean, hip hop is, it, I mean, it's all mainstream now. And it's so funny. I was uh, watching a, a video on YouTube and it was talking about fashion and every, all this here, you know. And it was, you know, hip hop fashion, lots of sequins and flashiness. And I was thinking back, it's like, wait, the hip hop was like Tim's and jeans and khakis and all of that, <laughs> you know, and it, you know, it's it's interesting. Back in the day when you were starting this, you know, could you imagine hip hop being what it is today? 
You know, I get asked that a lot. I think I think that I felt that it would be around, of course. Mm. Um, and people, the biggest question I get is, is what do you think of today's hip hop? And I, I always say that, you know, hip hop is one of those forms of music. Well, all forms of music do it, but hip hop is constantly evolving and they're constantly reinventing themselves. And you also have to understand that hip hop is a reflection of what's going on in the neighborhood, in the streets. And so however they have to uh, reflect that upon people, I'm fine with it, you know? Um, I'm not a big auto-tune fan, to be honest with you, but I am a fan of these kids having another way out besides robbing or uh, drug dealing, uh, you know, that, that they can take music that touches so many people and make it, uh, you know, continue to to make money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't, I, I'm so proud of all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite is Cardi B, I'm sorry. I love me some Cardi B, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I like, uh, oh. I, I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I like I like what's going on. I, I'm glad to see that it's a multi-billion dollar business. I had no idea. When we were doing it, we weren't doing it for the money. We were having fun. Um, I probably should have did more on the business side <laughs> because mm -hmm. I'd probably be very wealthy. But at that time, you weren't thinking about money. You were thinking about, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to have fun, blah, 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 blah. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of where we were at. And, and it's funny. I'm going to tell you this quick story. I was telling my mom the other day. I said, you know, the uh, thing is, is, yeah, people kind of know who I am. They really don't know who I am, you know, and uh, I said, but I'm going to be like the guy that invented, you know, you always see these stories about, well, a black person invented this, a black person started that and blah, blah, blah. And I said, so uh, even if people don't recognize me now, one day when I'm gone, there'll be Greg Johnson uh, on the thing saying, well, Greg Mack, is the guy that did this, da, 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 or Violet, when she tells her story, it'll be the same thing. So I think it has to come from somebody else in order to, to mm -hmm. have the true respect. And I'm fine with that. You know, mm -hmm. I'm happy. I, I have a, if, if I left this earth tomorrow, I would be fine because I've lived a full life. I still continue to have a full life. And uh, I still just get excited when I see you know, watching some of these award shows when they're doing the 50th anniversary hip hop. And I see all these cats that I was the first DJ to ever play their record and they're up there, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, in front of <laughs> millions of people. That's what I get excited about. Mm -hmm. Violet, biggest rap record you ever had? Oh. Straight out of Compton was huge, huge, huge for us. Um, I mean, there were just so many, the chronic, so again, part of the family of NWA too. But yeah. uh, those records were just absolutely huge. But there were so many, you know, but those in particular, the first Snoop Dogg album, I used to have to sit there and hand adjust orders for the stores because our system, uh, the way that the orders printed out and the computer and that sort of thing, I would look at the order and I would go, that's not near enough for this store. So I was hand adjusting store by store by store, staying up all night sometimes, hand adjusting those orders. And wow. uh, I remember there was one record label where um, uh, it was an Ice Cube record, I believe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I believe it was the Ice Cube record. And also for the first Snoop Dogg record, I had uh, given them an order and they said, um, you know, uh, Violet, they called me up. They said, Violet, can you possibly cut that order a little bit? Because we're really nervous. That's a lot of records to ship. And we are very afraid of putting that much out. What if it doesn't sell? And I said, I'm not nervous about what it's going to sell. It's going to sell that. And I said, and guess what? I'm going to give you another order next week on top of this one. And they were like, no, no, please just do me a favor. Just cut it back a little bit. And I refused. And they actually called the owner of warehouse and asked him to talk to me, the buyer, and have me to reduce that order. So uh, he talked to me and I said, look, we need this. I said, I know in my heart of hearts that we need this. I said, I will 
you know, I will bet you that we are going to need every single bit of this. And uh, we did. And we placed another order the next week. And then that record label said, you know what? I'll never question your buy again, you know, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. that happened on a few occasions. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I will say, too, that um, having Greg on here is important for me, too, because, you know, uh, a lot of records there were records that broke on the East coast with East coast rappers. And we sold all of those records in my stores, but you know, when things started to happen on the West coast, people often didn't want to believe that there was another area besides New York and the East coast that was going to sell records and uh, sell records in a strong way. And, um, (laughs) With Greg being on board with these records, of course, you know, we were able to break these records and sell them like crazy, you know, and and people were starting to buzz all over the nation about K-Day here, you know, on the West Coast, and other people would follow his lead. Eventually, at first, they wanted to cancel Greg Mack. They didn't want him uh, doing this, you know, uh, a lot of these people from record labels that were starting to put out little rap records, they didn't even believe in what they had. Some of the mm-hmm. old guys that were in charge at the labels, it was the younger A&M, A&R cats, the guys that brought the stuff in that believed in it. But the older guys, they didn't believe in it. It wasn't R&B. It wasn't a singer. It wasn't. It was something new and different. And, you know, talking about things going on in the streets, they didn't want to hear about it. So they tried to many of those people tried to cancel Greg. They tried to um, say that I wasn't um, a good buyer because I was bringing these this product into the stores. And these same people that tried to cancel Greg and cancel rap and they talked all this crap about rap, those same people finally got on board and then they were all about it. Like they were there from the beginning, like they supported it from the beginning. They loved it all along. And I can tell you they did not, you know, and those same people tried to tried to put us down and tried to to cancel us back in the day. So the cancel mm-hmm. culture, this ain't new. This ain't new right. to, Greg <laughs> and to myself. Right. You know, this actually happened back in the day, all because of rap music. You know, I admire K Day man as a radio. I remember y'all had AM stereo. Man, it's like that's new technology. You know, not only you're leading that was a bust. The- huh? That was a bust. <laughs> It was a bust. Okay, that, was, that was the question. Did it work? <laughs> they came out. They came out with this new technology, AM stereo, and so we had this big event. We were going to let people hear it, be the first to hear AM stereo, and all it sounded like was two AM radios side by side. You know, <laughs> that was a bust, man. That was a bust. But it was cool, though. It was cool, though. Yeah, it was a nice thing. I used to have a lot of people that would drop by my office, artists, they would come up on their own without a record label. Some of them didn't have a record label. They would have records in the trunk of their car and wanted me Mm -hmm. to buy it. And there was sometimes a a whole line of people in the lobby waiting to get in to see me and uh, tell me about their records. And the first time I went up to K-Day, was the only time that I saw something that was just like my office right there because as I walked up into K-Day, there were, well, first of all, there was all these cars outside in the parking lot and they looked like <laughs> low riders and all these cars and people just standing out there talking. And then I tried to get in the door and there's so many people in the lobby, I can't get through. And these people were waiting to see Greg and, you know, so many of them, he would put them on and let them do live music on the air. I remember the first time I ever heard a uh, young MC he put him on, he was live on the radio rapping, you know, like he didn't have a record out and Greg nice. put him on. And I was like, Oh my God, listen to this guy, you know, <laughs> but that used to happen all the time. Everybody was trying to get their foot in the door with Greg mm-hmm. and also with myself because mm-hmm. we were the ones that were kind of spearheading a lot of spearheading that you know. a lot. Yeah. That's a, uh... Uh, that's a that's the truth. I saw it for myself. That's for sure. You know, you know, you know. We we're talking about we're we're t- centered on Long Beach Gives today, and you guys have mentioned Snoop's name a couple of times. And 
you know, isn't it something like I remember the controversy from that first album that Snoop Dogg had. It was like it was I was working at a radio scope in those days and it was it was a thing, right? That this new kid was coming out and his stuff was so vulgar and they were just, oh, everybody, oh my God, hide our daughters. You know, it was <laughs> it was really, really something. Now when, when you contrast that position back in those days to now he's a mainstream pop culture icon, like what do you think about that and how does that happen? Well, first of all, I would like to shout out Kelvin Anderson from the world famous VIP music here in Long Beach, who actually put people in the studio back in the day in the back of his store. And mm -hmm. Snoop was one of those kids, you know, that hung out there and recorded there. Warren G uh, spearheaded that, I believe, bringing him in. And mm -hmm. so shout out to Kelvin because he was a big part of Snoop's career, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say that Snoop took off kind of like wildfire, you know, like mm -hmm. out here, we, we knew about Snoop out here and, um, you know, in, in, uh, buying music for the stores, I could always put an artist in a certain city if that's where they were from because my thing was i always gave everybody a chance because i said every one of these artists they have a fan somewhere their mamas live in their city they may be from fresno california and their mamas are there their aunties are there all those kids they went to school with are there so let's put yeah. that record in fresno california and then as it starts to happen elsewhere if they go over next door to some other city and start doing a little bit of shows or here and there, we can move it around. Well, mm -hmm. with Snoop, you know, and hearing that record and uh, especially after, you know, a whole NWA craze, you know, that record, I put it everywhere, of course, out of the gate. And like I said, I was hand adjusting orders because yeah, I had to hand adjust areas of the West coast that I knew it would, be much bigger in, you know, but to see uh, Snoop now on TV, on movies, on talk shows, hosting game shows, on TV right. with Martha Stewart, of all people, mm. you know, and, um, <laughs> to see like, to go to the grocery store and there's a whole end cap of his cereals that he has now, yes. you know, yes. go to the pet store and there's pet stuff that that him and Shantae put together, you know, for pet stores and, mm -hmm. and, and it's great stuff. But anyway, uh, to see all that is just to to know where he came from, to see that now, you know, I can't believe that we were there to yeah. watch the growth in this, you know, yeah. Yeah. just amazing. Yeah. It is amazing, amazing. What do you think, Greg? <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute it. Um, I mean, Violet's right. I mean, it's it's uh, fascinating to see these guys that um, you have to understand. They used to come hang out with me at the radio station a lot. I remember uh, Ice Cube and Sir Jinx would come up often uh, when they had their little group before they uh, joined NWA. I used to hang out at my friend Lonzo of the World Class Wrecking Crew. We'd hang out in his garage, me and Dr. Dre and Yella, uh, doing a Christmas song. Um, there's so many stories, even when Tupac used to come visit. I mean, there's so many stories. So to see, you know, where uh, this is all gone, it's just, it's, it's heartwarming, to be honest with you. And the relationship that I uh, have, and, you know, even with what a lot of people don't know is I had fantastic relationship with all the local gang members. Uh, and so they taught me a lot. When I first moved to L.A., uh, the late singer Barry White hit me to the streets because if 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 he were alive today, he would be telling me, man, why are you wearing that blue? <laughs> you know, because <laughs> Barry, uh, you know, I was a country boy. I come from small, you know, poor family and uh, in a small city in Texas. And so I was really naive to the streets. And that's probably why I was able to relate to the to the kids, because uh, they knew that I was green and naive and uh, I had no ill intentions. 
And so they would open up to me and we'd talk about things. Even if there was a, a drive-by, these guys would call me at the radio station. You remember that guy that used to be on Channel 5 KTLA? Uh, what was his name? Warren Wilson. And so anytime there was some gang member in trouble, he would be there with them to turn them in and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I kind of had that relationship going on on the radio. And so uh, I didn't take advantage of it. What I did is I, I learned from it and I started to understand why certain songs were being done mm -hmm. and uh, what they were trying to reflect. And if you don't like rap music, that's OK. But if you really want to understand it, it's nothing more than sitting there and listening. And uh, if you listen to the lyrics that they're saying, some of them may be vulgar um, to get their point across. People are shocked that when I say, well, they say, well, what's your favorite song? It's it's uh, N.W.A. F. the police, mm -hmm. not because <clears throat> I don't like police, because I'm a strong supporter of law enforcement. But almost everything that that Q wrote on that song is true. It's yep. stuff that I was dealing with because when I first got to LA, I was living in South Central LA in probably the rougher part. And um, I knew what he was talking about. And I got pulled over all the time, mm -hmm. you know, for driving a nice car. You mm -hmm. must be a drug dealer. You know, mm -hmm. I had my my uh, wife at that time who was Hispanic. We'd get pulled over all the time because they thought I was a pimp. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> that's why I can relate to F the police. Now, if you're mm -hmm. talking about me going out and, and telling my officer friends, F you, I'm not going to do that because I support them. Uh, I think that just like any occupation, there are some knuckleheads. And so I don't, you know, judge all of them by a uh, couple of bad uh, incidents. And I don't judge rappers who come up from the streets that really are being exposed to a whole new world when they have a hit record that they may slip up and make a mistake mm -hmm. and uh and it's okay you know to to make a mistake so anyway i'm just rambling on but uh i can say this uh with what violet did uh, by allowing them because nobody no major record store would carry their music and that's so important you can have a hit record but if can't nobody buy it they didn't have downloading back then you couldn't download to the brick phone you know and so the only way that they could get it is either through violet or what they were doing before violet is a swap meet swap so, meet yes uh, you know and i'm glad she mentioned kelvin he was a huge uh, uh part of with vip records and so they, they were very limited because so many people looked down upon them and us and me. And, uh, you know, they a lot of them are sitting back right now and they're like, how did these people become billionaires? How did these people yeah. Yeah. <laughs> become superstars? And I think Violet described it best when you were talking about Snoop, uh, who I'm so proud of. Um, so I'm just happy that all these guys are doing so well. I really am. You know, a lot of people didn't know either, but I had to do a lot of my buying based on uh, the gang activity, too, because I would, uh, from knowing the streets and knowing more about it, I was able to place some of the artists that were leaning more blue or red to those particular cities and mm -hmm. states. You know, when they would be released, I would go, OK, they're going to really support these guys over in uh, in uh, St. Louis, Missouri and in Kansas City and that sort of thing. And that's where I'm going to put it. So a lot of that was based on that as well, that type of buying, mm -hmm. which a lot of the other buyers did not understand that portion of it. But that was a it was a big deal to know what was going on back mm -hmm. then. You had yeah. to know your customers, you mm -hmm. know. And you knew when a battle record came out that you better be ready to buy that that answer record, right? That's <laughs> right. The average person wouldn't know that. And a lot of those battle records, I was in the studio when they were made, and and the groups that were battling would be in there and say, okay, uh, I'm going to talk about your mama, you talk about my... I mean, it was planned because they knew it planned. would sell. Yeah. You know? Sure, sure, sure. And so interesting right there. You know, let's talk about, let's kind of contemplate like hip hop as, or rap music as what they call fine art. Okay. And I'm, what I'm alluding to is, 
I've been having this conversation briefly with uh, the uh, president of the Long Beach Symphony and about, you know, kind of mashups of contemporary popular music with symphonic compositions. And one of the examples that I have shared is when Nas did his, um, uh, what's the anthem to New York that he had? Uh, classic, help me out. Um, anyway, he did the, the album with the Kennedy Center Symphony, and it was yes. fantastic. You can see it on YouTube and P PBS and all that. It's fantastic, you know. Understand, you he all... wasn't the he wasn't the first one. Sir Mix a Lot did the first one, but go ahead. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So that's I said. Okay. You know, what do you think of the these types of mashups, these intersections of rap music as an art form uh, colliding with, um, you know, symphonic compositions? And you talk go, about I would go to like that about was Sir, Sir Mix a Lot. Tell, tell the people, educate us. I, I would go to the symphony a lot more. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I would love to go in there and see them uh, doing uh, straight out of Compton. Uh, I think it's fabulous because what it's telling me is that people are starting to understand the culture and starting to, uh, uh, you know, adjust is what I would say. Uh, but I like the symphony, but I'll be honest with you, it, it can get boring. Um, and I don't really know a lot of the arrangements, but if I were to go see Nas or uh, I love looking at that Sir Mix-a-Lot video, that's just unreal. But uh, when I see that kind of stuff, I would go to that. I would. Would you, Violet? I, I sure would. And I want to add something here, too. You know, if we've had hip hop around for 50 years and many of us were teenagers or young adults when hip hop started, that means now we're we're older. We're old, yeah, you yeah. know. Right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, to the people that sit in those uh symphonies playing those instruments now they were also if they've been alive for the past 50 years they listen to other things besides the type of music they're doing you know they've listened to hip-hop they love hip-hop in most cases you know that's how come we see newscasters on the news now reciting lyrics from songs just to be hip on their on their broadcast on tv because they that's their life they've lived hip-hop so many of those people sitting in the symphony they've lived it and so the people that are going to sit in those seats and watch them have lived it too so it makes all the sense in the world that they are doing symphonic virgin versions of albums and artist catalog and things like that i would go to the symphony if i heard more of that just like greg we'd sit there with oh. greg Hip hop transcends, you know, hip hop um, can fit with any type of music. If you look at what uh, Run DMC did with Aerosmith, in my opinion, revived their career when they uh, collabed on Walk This Way. Uh, if you look at what Lil Nas X did with Country, uh, you can, you can kind of transcend hip hop into all types of music. And I'll tell you this, I think that when hip hop was bloom was booming with the old school sound, I think it helped rock music a lot because a yeah. lot of the alternative music uh, was based on hip hop beats. And so it transcends. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of country artists now, they've got rappers in the middle of their songs and there's mm -hmm. country rappers now, too. In every genre, there's rappers or hip hop uh based music in those other genres and you know it's a big deal now you know mm -hmm. for uh country artists to come mm -hmm. out and do a collab with somebody like Flo Rida or something like that now you know that's mm -hmm. a big deal mm -hmm. I'm you know I, 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 I'm not trying to be rude but I'm, I'm sitting here trying to get our links in here uh Violet for the Long Beach Gives you know and uh you know I I I've been teasing folks because you, you're you've got a lot of friends that you've uh, that have answered your call to support the Arts Council for Long Beach. And the other day, you were like, you know, I'm a call so and so, very well known artist, and I was sitting there looking at you, going, Well, dang, I can't. I, I had to call his people, <laughs> but you have so many direct relationships. Uh, you know, talk to the people about the importance of relationships because the thing we're talking about 
the reason it's relevant is because I saw some post about Long Beach Gives where the um, the people who are receiving invitations to give were, you know, a little distressed because they were saying, well, look, you don't call me anytime except for when, uh, when you need something, then isn't this about relationships? And I thought that was a really excellent point. And, you know, all of us have, we probably still wouldn't be standing where we are today if we didn't have long-term, good, strong relationships uh, based on our experiences. Talk about your relationships you've had out there and how you've been able to maintain them for so long. You wanna start, Greg, or? No, you go ahead. Okay, well, I can say that I have a lot of relationships from uh, my days at Warehouse Music and even connected to record labels after that. After that, I was able to do work as an A&R consultant. That means signing new groups and finding new talent for record labels. And I did some things with Priority Records. I was with Interscope. Uh, Hollywood records and that sort of thing. But I think that I built a lot of relationships back then because I was always straightforward with people, honest with them. I wouldn't, um, you know, as we say, blow smoke up there behind, you know, by telling them they're great if they weren't, you know, I was always realistic with them about their records. And I think that people appreciated that and, um, you know, a lot of the relationships I built back then, I still have those relationships today with a lot of artists, with a lot of people mm -hmm. at record labels and that sort of thing, uh, because I was a person that they could rely on to tell them the truth about things. Um, so, you know, I'm happy that I still have these relationships with people. And I call on everybody, it, you know, I put it on my pages, you know, about um, Long Beach Gives. But there are certain people, you know, that they don't always, they're not always looking at social media. So I may reach out to them separately about it. Um, but um, the relationships in the business are everything, you know, like if uh, people that that have faded away from this business, like they close, they left their companies or whatever, and they're gone and you don't see them anymore. They had no relationships, you know, for some reason or another, they just didn't click with people. Mm -hmm. And I think that both Greg and I have long lasting relationships with um, some of these people. Now there's a whole lot of people we've also helped that, you know, they probably wouldn't be there if we need them, but we know the ones that, that will be there for us and for life. That's right. Let's take I think with um, I think with a lot of these guys, um, I don't know. I, I first of all, I'll say again, I'm very happy for them. I I don't because people always say, well, you know, did they come back and help you and blah 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 blah. I you know I felt like they did when they were doing what they were doing. I've always felt like. Um, if they had not been successful, nobody would be checking for me or Violet, because if the records hadn't have sold and they hadn't became a big success, uh, Violet and I would probably be, you know, working with Greg over there and, <laughs> you know, helping the community because we'd be doing something. And so yeah. um, I don't, you know, as far as uh, relationships and stuff, I've uh, been friends with the best. It's usually, and Violet, I'm sure you will attest to this, it's usually because everybody that you are friends with are running here and there. But when you see each other, it's all love. And mm -hmm. so uh, from, you know, Russell Simmons, Lear Cohen, you know, the people that uh, we work together to, to, you know, do the live broadcast that we were doing, uh, from Violet and, and Monica to, to work together to allow me to be able to expose you know, the mix masters. And so I could go down a list and, and I, and I did once because I've been trying to get my, my darn film financed uh, so that I can get valid to help me. But I did a list and I said, let me see how many people that I really helped launch. And it was 60 something artists. Yeah. And uh, I said, you know, and, and I would say half of them are, you know, way up there in the millions uh, worth that. And so you know, I'm just proud. I'm proud of Dr. Dre. I'm proud of Ice Cube. It's always fun when Ice Cube and I still see each other. Uh, uh, 
out of all the rappers, I think it's important to note, out of all the rappers that I've known over the years, the one that I miss the most is Easy E. Yeah. Uh, Easy E was not what you thought. He was a very kind, uh, a very generous. Uh, a lot of people don't know that he used to take busloads of kids to amusement parks and just spend the day with them. And he didn't want it publicized. He just wanted to help the kids and uh, show them a, a part of life that they had never experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, Easy had signed. There wasn't too many groups Easy would say no to. <laughs> If they wanted a deal, he'd give them a deal just to put some money in their pockets. And mm -hmm. it wasn't necessarily that he thought they would be a, a, a big hit. Mm -hmm. um, and and he was just not, you know, he had to have that image. Yes. And uh, and even I was questioning him going to the Republican. Uh, uh, <laughs> Remember <dinner>. that? <laughs> um, but I, I thought about it. I says, oh, man, and easy, easy made a lot of sense. You know, hey, that fifteen hundred dollars, I got millions of dollars worth of press. Yeah. Right. So, right. Um, you know, I mean, the, the list is long about all the people that I, I've really appreciated working with. And, and I'm not done yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I I'm not afraid to tell you I'm 64, but uh, I'm not done yet. I'm going to I'm going right. to keep going until I can finally get the story out, because what scares me most about hip hop is all of the what I call his stories. And uh, I wanted to make sure that the stories get told correct. When I mm. see interviews, sometimes I cringe. It's like, that's not what happened. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, my son was doing a class on Tupac. And so he called me about a particular event. And I said, oh, son, you're going to get an A. Let me tell you what happened. And I told him what happened. And, and you know, he called me and told me he got an F because oh. the teacher said that that's not what was in the book. And I said, well, OK. And so I, said, I got the book and I read it. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, who wrote this? But yet that's the curriculum at the schools. It's so sad. And so, you know, I want to I want to continue so that we can at least get the west coast story correct and i'll tell you this the east coast even though the east coast didn't support west coast rappers last month i was in atlantic city new jersey uh co-hosting a big show over there big arena and so they wanted me to come out and i was like i don't know about this you know uh but when they introduced me i got a standing ovation i was shocked nice i was nice. shocked that that they're they're way more educated about you know what was going on out here than i thought and it was just it's just, just a good feeling so you know there's that east coast west coast thing but i think deep inside you know everybody's got love for each other uh with, with the east and west i would say yeah. that my number my number one guy was eric to, was easy e2 you mm -hmm. know and for mm -hmm. all those reasons that greg just said and mm -hmm. when i first met uh easy i met him at the rhodium swap meet back in the day you know mm -hmm. with a guy named mm -hmm. Steve Yano that used to sell records to djs out there mm -hmm. all the djs would go to Greg to uh steve to buy their records on a saturday morning because they were going to rock those records in the club on saturday mm -hmm. night you know on mm -hmm upcoming uh, Saturday, Sunday, and the whole week, you know. So we would go out there for all the 12-inch music that Steve Yano was pulling in that was all DJ copies and things like that. And that's how I also met Dre out there. And um, also Greg put out a record back then, you know, that was... <laughs> uh, which he'll you had to bring that, that up. <laughs> you know, but y'all uh, look... Speaking of Easy E, look who's dropped by to have coffee with us, Lonzo Williams. Hey, what up, Lonzo. folks? What up, Lonzo. folks? Lonzo. Yes. yes, yes. Are you hearing this stuff there, Lonzo? I'm listening to it, Doc. I just I was at the yeah. call. Actually, I was I, I saw your text. I thought yes. I'd tap in. Y'all talking about one of my hot subjects right now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, you know, well, look, we're talking about Easy E. Share with us. Now, you know, I just got the street be named after him in Compton, right? Yes. Ah, congratulations. Nice. congratulations. Yes. Uh, we, we'll, Easy Street will be in Compton. It's already been approved by the city council. Uh, we're planning the event right now. I'm, I'm meeting with the uh, street maintenance team to get the signs ordered. Uh, meeting with the city manager's office to uh, plan the festivities. 
and uh, I'm listening to you guys talk. And some of these things I forgot about, but it's amazing. I've got some pushback on the private end from some, a few people, and I I did not get a chance to. Uh, I wish I had known this information. Some of the information you guys are talking about right now, so I could use it as as a uh, fuel. But I got my own story with Easy. I knew Easy was a nice guy. Easy stumbled into his persona and it worked for him. It made money for him. Like so many people at the, we know of that if you, you may have been trained to be a doctor, but all of a sudden you, you'll find that you're that, that you better at doing something else. Easy wanted to be a record executive, but he found out that uh, uh, a five foot four guy talking crazy, getting more, get more money. <laughs> We laughed about this. Easy. How long are you gonna be this gangster dude? How long are they paying me for it, Lonzo? <laughs> that, was, that was that was his response. Okay, I, I tell people, Easy was never trying to be in any ciphers or trying to be uh, uh, trying to be a rapper. When those guys HBO didn't show up, when they didn't want to do that song, and Dre coached him into doing the song, it changed everything. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I'm glad to be a part of that history. Like I said. Uh, I was his first mentor when it came to get, get into the record business. I introduced him to his first lawyer, which was my lawyer. Uh, took him to my, my graphic designer, uh, Daryl Davis, who drew his logo for Roosters Records. Same guy, same guy drew all my labels for uh, my covers for, for uh, Crew Cut. And also introduced me to Jerry Heller. Okay, uh, that was something I didn't think would work, but I, I don't know every damn thing, so I learned something. So it is what it is, Doc, and I think um, it's a great thing for Compton. Uh, like I said, but I've had a little pushback, and uh, some of these extra things that I've learned today from Bonded and Greg are uh, always good for a good debate. Mm-hmm. I certainly want to be there when they uh, do the uh, put the sign up and uh, get yeah. up and say a few words. Oh, definitely, Doc. We have. Let we, me we, know, Lonzo. We having a yeah. sing ding, baby. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I just called Phyllis Pollock, who was Easy's uh, publicist, to um, get ready, to get everything. Only what we haven't announced it yet. We haven't got the date yet. I won't get the date until I, uh, till I get the uh, logistics from the signs being made. That's well, the one thing we have to do right now. So Phyllis, once Phyllis, we get an ETA Phyllis, on the sign, I haven't heard Phyllis's name in so long. Please send me my either. Line. <laughs> yeah, Phyllis is probably oh. so happy right now. Oh yeah. Absolutely, she's been. Yeah, so I'm waiting to hear. Um, also, we um we're gonna be doing the uh we're probably do it in February in uh, November. The November Hip Hop Appreciation Month. We got a location pretty much set in. Uh, it's gonna be in the parking lot of the uh, casino, which is right off of Easy Street, and uh, we just ha- have to secure a date. My tentative date right now is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Awesome. Okay, so uh, that's the tentative date. I won't. I can't lock it in just yet, but um, for holiday reasons, I don't. I don't want to get caught up in the holiday or whatever. But I want to kick out the holiday with some something, something cool for the city. Yeah, sure. And sure. you know, back in the day, p- people were lucky enough to run into these guys in the streets. You know, there was a time uh, where uh, we were very involved with. Uh, easy because he we often would kind of watch his kids for him while he would be doing things he would drop them off with us my boys would watch the kids that sort of thing and there was a birthday party that we were invited to for his youngest son for Derek's very first birthday and it was at Chuck E. Cheese in Lakewood and all in WA (laughs) Chuck E. Cheese in Lakewood can you imagine walking into a Chuck E. Cheese and NWA's in there and Jerry Heller was in there and you know, probably Lonzo was there too. There was so many people there that went. For I dinner. wanted that one right there. I, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I got a Chuck E. Cheese phobia. I've been to Chuck E. Cheese so much. I'm scared of Chuck E. Cheese now. <laughs> it's the kid's casino. You know, I would tell I would tell people Easy was the only guy that was a gangster rapper. They always had his kids in tow. Easy kept his kids around him. And Lil E was at my house in in a uh, in in a car seat back in the days. So, you know, when you yeah. know a guy like that, you, you know this guy before. I knew him before he became Easy E. I knew Eric Wright, so it makes a big difference from how I, you know how I feel about the person. And like I said before, I'm glad to hear you guys able to uh, share these stories and uh, update my 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 Easy E database. Yeah, Eric mm-hmm. would be uh, easy. Would be laughing at me right now because I and you notice I call him Eric because I was introduced to him as Eric. So it was always so hard for me to switch 
from you call a guy one name for so long and then all of a sudden you're calling him something else. So out of respect, I would say easy. But on all of the things that he ever signed for me or gave me cards, he would always sign Eric really big on it because he that's what I called him, you know. Mm -hmm. Wow. Man, that wow, that this is fantastic, fantastic, man. Hall of Famers. You know, I often, I, I want to share with all, all three of you all, like I often just self-reflect, like I, I'm very much in the moment, right? And sometimes I'm like, man, this moment to be on this uh, live stream podcast with the three of you all, like super, super, super legends. You know, it's just a divine gift from the most high. And I really appreciate all of you all's friendship, your partnership, your uh, colleagueship, you know, and this is really just awesome to, to sit here and contemplate this important history uh, in our time. And, um, you know, thank you all so much for, for just being you and uh, what you have meant, meant to uh, to our industry. Greg, I want to ask you one question, though. I, I, I'm i curious about the Mix Masters. Now, was uh, DJ Curtis Harmon there? DJ Curtis Harmon was not a Mix Master, uh, per okay, se. He, wasn't. He, okay. he, he did he did mix uh, for the station after I left there. And uh, okay. uh, I think that a lot of people confused, you know, that he, he was a Mix Master. But, okay. I mean, he's an honorary Mix Master. You know, because yeah, 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 I, yeah, I absolutely yeah. love Curtis. He was yeah. working with me at Warehouse during that time, too. Uh -huh. ah, good guy. Okay. Yes, yes. Love good Curtis. guy. That's my people's right there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Back and forth to Japan. And now is, what is it? Mohammed uh, Absalom. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Brother Mohammed. Mohammed Absalom, I think, is the, is now his Islam name. But very That's why I very couldn't good, say it, because I can't pronounce it either. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> He, he, he's he gonna be like my brother him. regardless you know that's right yes, that's yes. real talk yes 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 yeah yeah that's yes. like the easy you will, you will. I, I can't stop calling him curtis Harmon. so right, right he, exactly i want to respect him i can't say the last part of the name but to me he's always curtis Harmon. but i definitely love him either way muhammad or whatever yeah, that's right. But to, but to give you a, give you a little piece of information, first of all, it was Kid Frost that introduced me to my first mix master. Okay. Um, Lonzo helped me get Dre and Yeller to do some mixes, but they uh, after they left is when I formed the mix masters, and uh, that was Kid Frost that helped us. And also understand that uh, hopefully within the next two or three months here, the LA Times is going to be saluting uh, 1580 K Day and the mix masters at a special event that we're putting together. And so all of the mix masters, uh, Trasky is no longer with us, uh, but all the mix masters that are still on earth, uh, I'm going to anticipate uh, will be there. And hopefully a lot of local groups like Lonzo and, and Wrecking Crew and uh, some of the other local guys will come out and uh, be a part of it. So the LA Times, I, I'm, a, I, I'm just shocked at, uh, at how great they've been as far as uh, making sure that uh, you know, the real stories get out in hip hop. They're very, very good at that. And so I, I have a hats off to them and Spectrum News. So uh, be looking forward to that. Okay, looking forward. I'm going to be hitting you up, Lonzo. You guys don't yeah, sleep yeah. on Spectrum. Don't sleep on Spectrum because they got the real stories. Yes, <laughs> yes they do. This you is know, what I, I see. watch yes. that all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before we change channels here, we're going to be on live streaming and all day long. We, you know, raise some funds for Long Beach Gives. You guys see our links in the chat. Oh, thank you so much for that. Supporting nonprofits. Going to hear from other nonprofits and arts folks, you know, that are directly connected to the Arts Council for Long Beach for sure uh, all day today. But uh, I want to reflect with y'all to contemplate with me. I had... Uh, Y'all remember Muffler from the one half of the L.A. Posse? Uh, you Dwayne. Know, yeah. Yeah, Dwayne. Yeah, yeah. So I had Dwayne on the other day, and he and we were saying, I was asking him, man, reflect on hip hop in Long Beach. And he went there with the Long Beach Arena, the, the Fresh Fest, you know, and we were talking about that. Do you all remember the Fresh Fest in Long Beach? And we contemplate did. on that a little bit with us. I didn't go. 
I did. I heard about it. I did not go. Um, I was. Uh, I think I was running the Eve after dark at the time, and uh, I just didn't feel comfortable. I have a sick sense about things like that. Sometimes it's, I, I know I just keep my butt at home. And I heard about what happened. It was. It wasn't a surprise, but I know it would be that big. Yeah. Yeah, giant. It's a big deal, right? It's, ama- it's it amazing. Deal. It's, it's amazing to me that most every interview I do, the very first question I get is that, what you just uh, asked, and uh, uh, the impact I guess that it had uh, on what was going on at that time. And um, I was there. I was on stage when it started. I was on stage when somebody threw threw a body over the balcony and landed on stage balcony. behind me. Uh, I was there when you know a lot of the drama fell out and the security guards started taking off their shirts uh the the last thing you want to see at a rap show is the security guards (laughs) taking off their shirts because they don't want to be known as security you knew you knew there was something going down uh but that's a story that uh is unfortunately uh uh a block on hip-hop but let's understand these kind of things happen at all genres of music yeah. And, you know, sometimes uh, S happens. And that was that was one of those. I'm going to get more detailed about it when I uh, do some future things, because I was right there. And it, it was a scary, scary uh, thing. But you have to understand, and I'm sure Alonzo can attest to this, that we've been to a lot of scary things, yeah. uh, probably just as bad. I don't know how many times I've heard bullets swoosh by my ear. Oh, yeah. And, Man. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's the bad the feeling. Point. That's yeah. a bad that's not, feeling. No, it's a good feeling that you know that you're still there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, go ahead, Violet. I'm sorry. I remember something like that at the Celebrity Theater over there in uh, mm-hmm. Anaheim area yeah. too. You mm-hmm. know where it got really crazy, and I had to, I had mm-hmm. a bunch of kids with me, and we had to run out of there and jump mm-hmm. in the car and leave and that sort of thing. But um, you know, you mentioned Kid Frost earlier. And when Mm -hmm. Kid Frost put his first record out, um, Mm -hmm. I wanted to do a lot with that record. So I wanted to do a a show with him in um, the Linux area of all Mm -hmm. things in a park, a free concert to push him out there. So I got with Community Youth Gang Services, Marianne Diaz. And uh, we put together a concert that was going to be free and the city said that we couldn't do this thing, that it would be a big mess. There would be a riot and all this stuff. And I don't know how we talked them in to allowing us to do this. But the day that we did that concert, that park was full of gang members, red, blue, everybody together, standing beside each other. No fights broke out there. He did his big hit song, La Raza, right in front. Everybody was singing along, dancing, all of that. Crip walking, some people, you know, things like that. And there was not one bit of problem uh, during that concert, you know? Mm-hmm. And we didn't even have a lot of security for that, not like we probably should have, but um, we were just lucky nothing broke out. And then after that, I could do a lot of big in stores with gigantic artists and the block party that I used to do in the back of the store where, you know, people would perform on stage for free for the whole city to come out. And all of that happened, you know, because things started to really cool down. But uh, Kid Frost was a big part of that for me. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm visualizing. I might have been at one of the, I know I've been to your block parties there, uh, Violet. And I'm just thinking about Kid Frost and the essence of, you know, culture. Uh, as we get out of here to change lanes, we have some people in the waiting room we're going to bring in. Matter of fact, I'm going to bring him in here now because he's uh, from a generation, a, a couple generations behind us, and he's blessed to hear all of this knowledge here. You guys are uh, up-and-coming arts advocate. There's Ryan from Play Nice LB. Ryan, how are you this morning? Yeah, what's going on, everybody? I'm doing well. How are y'all? Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Look, you, you're sitting at the feet of the elders right here, youngin. <laughs> Talking up yeah, game. Right, Ryan's got right. that radio voice. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> you know, uh, so guys, just if you can just talk about, like, the impact. When I think of hip-hop from a West Coast perspective, car culture is really big to me. It's like comes in car culture is, is the thing, you know what I mean? And I was... It, um, 
watching a documentary and, and Dr. Dre was talking about his approach to producing records and how after they create this, the composition, they go out to the truck, you know, and listen to see how it's going to play across the, you know, across the speakers of the car. Car culture is really an essential, essential aspect of hip hop culture, particularly from a West Coast perspective. Can you reflect a little bit on that with me? Oh. Anybody? Anybody? Oh, I can I can attest to what Dre said, man, because at that time, when Dre would, they would do that, my neighbor would call the cops every time because they would turn it up as loud as they possibly could. This one speaker, they just put the boom boxes, started putting boom boxes in cars, the big 12 inch woofers or whatever. And uh, that was a, that was a testing point to see how this thing was going to play. In fact, when uh when me and unknown decided to break um uh, Compton's most wanted, we walked the streets of Compton and gave the uh, the EP to people in car club in cars in car clubs or big PA systems because those like street radio systems. People would you know they put them in the car. What was that? Because at that time even then rap was still fairly new. So anything that came out thought kind of banging, people people gravitated towards. So yeah, it was it's a big part of that, man. Uh, your sound system, most most sound systems in a car are bigger than the car systems in people's houses. I've seen guys with systems in cars that were bigger than the car systems I had in my club. Yep. I usually work about six speakers in my club. These guys have 35, 40 speakers with multiple amps. They have more watches than K-Day. 100,000 watts. <laughs> they have more more watches than K-Day. Multiple batteries. So, yeah, car culture, car, car culture is a a major uh, part of the hip-hop culture, especially on the, on the West Coast, because all we do is drive anyway. Mm -hmm. What I used to say, there's nothing better than listening to the music in the car. I mean, I used to... You know, the demos would come in, artists would come in and drop their demo with me or record labels would come in and drop the music. And I would always li I could listen to it in my office. But if it made it to the car, that was a big deal. And I would take stacks every day to the car because I wanted to hear it in there as loud as I could rock it. And if it sounded good in the car, I knew that that is going to sound really good to everybody else, too. So that was like my little listening uh, room was in the car more than anything. And a lot of times the labels or the artists would say, well, let me see if my record will make it to the car. You know, they used to kid me about that because I would tell them if it makes it to the car, that's a big deal. Nice, nice, nice. What about you, Greg? What do you think? Car culture? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, I can't go any further than Alonzo and, and Violet. What I did want to say, though, is, is because I do have to get off mm -hmm. <laughs> because I've, I've got another Zoom standing by. But okay. what you're doing, uh, Greg, is so important. And I want you to keep on doing it. Anytime that you need me on, you just hit me up. Uh, and to be on with Violet and Alonzo at the same time, that's like, you know, I'm over here um, just in awe. And um, I do want to say that you guys can still hear me on the radio in Los Angeles on 94.7 The Wave. Uh, you can hear me on 30 different radio stations across the country, three of them overseas in the UK, the Virgin Islands and uh, Jamaica. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that that are still in the works. So I'm just excited to to still be doing what I enjoy. And I thank all of you for supporting me. Uh, over the years. And the one thing Violet brought up, I did want to uh, touch upon that. And that is, is that the people that grew up listening to us and enjoying what we had going on during those years, uh, I am shocked sometimes when I meet executives of companies that grew up with that. And so that was a very good point, Violet. And so, you know, just thank you for having me, Greg. Uh, I did want to say with Alonzo, that what you did recently uh, for prostate cancer awareness was awesome. Uh, nice. At one uh, last year, I had something that I thought was uh, prostate cancer. And uh, because I go every year and get checked, uh, we were able to identify it and it, we were able to eliminate it before it became uh, prostate cancer. So I say to all uh, men uh, and black men, to at least get checked every year. It is so important because it can sneak up on you. And I have lost a lot of friends 
uh, because of it. So I don't, I guess we lost Lonzo, but uh, yeah. it was very important what he did. So thank you for having me, Greg. Unfortunately, I'm running like late now. That's all right. We got to go to our next chapter anyway. It's all good. I appreciate yeah, you so keep much. Keep doing what you're in. doing, man. And Violet, yes, I love sir. you to death. So, Violet, you remember? I don't, wait, before I go, let me just say this. I don't know if many of you know. There's a country song, and it says that this guy he was in love with his this girl so much that uh, he'd write bad checks just to get her everything that she wanted. You know. And so that's the way I feel about Violet. If Violet ever yeah. called me and said, hey, man, you know, I need this, I need that. You know what? If I'm going to write a bad check, it's going to be to Violet. Okay? <laughs> to make yeah. sure it's covered. I'll make sure it's covered, though. Thank that's you. How, that's how much I love and respect this lady. I love you, too. She is yes, a true. Yes. She is a true legend. So yes, thank you, is. guys. <laughs>